So we're here in uh, Thessaloniki at the Nanotechnology Conference. And hi, so who are you? Well, I'm Ravi Silva. I'm the director of the Advanced Technology Institute at the University of Surrey. I also act as an advisor to the Sri Lankan government with regard to uh, energy and nanotechnology. So um, the University of Surrey is just outside London, right? That's correct. It's, it's about 25 miles south of London and we uh, specialize uh, particularly in providing uh, solutions to everyday problems. So as a university, we are a top 10 university, uh, very much oriented towards the applied sciences. And uh, so you focusing on doing things that are real in the real life and that becomes useful? Absolutely. I think the whole point of our research and our university is about finding solutions to society and one of the great challenges that we have are, are the grand challenges faced by humanity at present and these uh, uh, are so significant that we need to have multidisciplinary teams that work uh, in a synergistic manner to solve these both scientifically technologically so that there are engineering solutions that are provided so i guess it's there's a lot of different fields that are covered that are worked on, but one of them that you're talking about here is um, stuff like this, right? Yes. This this could potentially change the world. Absolutely, the probably the greatest problem faced by humanity at present is energy. In, in fact, uh, if you look at the work that was uh, sponsored initially by Rick Smalley, the Nobel laureate who discovered buckyballs. Uh, he asked uh, some of his Nobel laureate friends as well as policymakers, what are the greatest challenges faced by humanity in the next 50 years? When he compiled the data, he was surprised to see that energy was number one. And when you start thinking about this, you can find out why energy is even higher than poverty, food or water. Simply because if you have unlimited sources of energy, you can do desalination, you can do greenhouses that provide your foods. So as a result, if you can solve the energy crisis, uh, there are many other problems, grand challenges that can be also addressed. So in society, we are doing impressive stuff with energy, but we need to master it much better, right? That is correct. At present, uh, energy is one of those very strange phenomena where it does not follow any standard economic principle. If you, if you think of the standard, uh, models associated with supply and demand, you would say that the supply dictates the demand and, and the cost associated with that. But energy just baffles everyone. So for example, the sunlight that we see in this beautiful day in Thessaloniki, there's around 165,000 terawatts of energy coming on Earth on a daily basis whole of humanity put together would use about 10 to 15 terawatts on a daily basis. So there is this huge oversupply of energy coming to the earth from the sun that we are not utilizing. 10 times more than what we need? 10,000 times more 10, than what we need. More. So it's a huge factor really. So we just need to take a small piece of it and we have free energy. That's absolutely correct and that basically what drives myself and my group that we hope that by just taking a small fraction, 0.01% of the energy that is irradiating uh, the earth, and we can solve the world's greatest problem, which is energy. So if I just stand right here, uh, in Thessaloniki is very bright, sunny day, where are the solar panels going to be? Uh, there seems to be a lot of space everywhere, uh, but uh, there, there are, there's got to be studies about where you put them, right? And there's uh, lots of space for them? Th there are studies as to where you need to put them. And that also highlights one of the major problems associated with it. Because at present, the world is based on centralized, grid-based energy provision. In the future, it has to be much smarter. And actually, that's where the name comes from on smart grids. The whole idea is that you will have micro and mini grids all over the world that starts providing energy for those various regions. Now by doing so, you reduce the energy loss that you see in transmission lines. 
typically from the point at which energy is produced to the point at which the consumer uses it, there is over 50% of the energy lost in transmission. So you can just imagine that energy that's not just lost to humanity, but it heats the environment too. So as a result, the consequences are absolutely dire. So we are losing 50% now in the system we have now? Absolutely right. We are losing more than 50% in the system. And it doesn't matter which system you use, whether it's based on uh, uh, power generation on coal or whether it's based on uh, gas, petroleum products, all of these lose around 50% of the energy, particularly when you have grid-based transmission lines associated with it. So every time you have a up converter or a down converter to get, regulate your voltage, there is energy loss associated with it. So, uh, if, if I'm just going to film here one, one, one more time, how, how do you, uh, um, uh, what's called, uh, how do you build a smart grid? Is it, is it, is it relatively uh, straight ahead? Uh, do people know how to do this or is it like you need to invent new things? It's a bit of both, you know, technology is such that, uh, you know, you could take the example of the Apple iPad. The iPad really cr has created a major revolution in terms of technology, the way you run meetings, the way you have data at your fingertips in order to run your various meetings. Now, when the iPad initially came, it wasn't a revolutionary technology. It was purely bringing together of different technologies that already existed. Capacitive so, touch? Absolutely, all of that came about purely based on technology that was invented probably 10 years before that. So much like that, in the case of the smart grid, we have all those components around us. It's really about bringing them together. The most important part of this is being able to facilitate the energy capture. And that's where solar cells comes in. So your original question as to where do solar cells sit? Solar cells can be grid-based or off-grid based. I think the typical idea that I would have is every rooftop that you see should have some sort of solar cells on there. Now if within those uh, buildings itself that it can provide just the air conditioning provision for those buildings on sunny days such as these, you're probably going to reduce your energy consumption by 20% or more on the energy used to cool your buildings. And the irony really at the end of the day is that in the colder climates during winter, you're probably using 20% of your energy bill to heat the buildings. So once more, the idea is that you will be able to have uh, lower carbon footprints of your building by using the energy during the peak hours and then if you're not at home and using your electricity, you could have a way of paying it back through a feed-in tariff to the smart grid that keeps these centralized energy systems that can then be used by others. Uh, another example of where the smart grid could work hugely in favor of changing uh, the human mindset is electric cars. So for example, if we were to take the transportation sector, which is dominated by fossil fuels, over 80% of your energy comes from fossil fuels. Now, if we were to try and decarbonize that particular sector, you need to go to electric vehicles. And now once everyone has an electric vehicle, that means they have their energy storage capacity within their household, i.e. in their car. So you could potentially use solar cells in order to travel, and, and fill in your lithium-ion battery or any other type of battery that you might be using for your car. But during the night, it could act as your storage point where other sunnier climates would be charging your batteries for you uh, while it gets stored for later use uh, within your own household. Well, at peak time uh, requirements, the, the energy would come back from the batteries uh, it, uh, through uh, the smart grid, and if every single car is um, a big portion gets electric, there, there'll be a lot of storage in there. But ha, ha, uh, w uh, in, is anyone already doing the smart grids, or are they just talking about it? I think in academic circles, this is being looked at as something that is being researched actively. But it needs uh, government policy. It needs some sort of governance to come in to set the infrastructure in place that makes it a reality. It's not cheap, right? But it's required. We need a smart grid. Uh, 
again, I would say in terms of costing, the smart grid will need some sort of uh, capital to get it started, but it's not the huge amounts that you're talking about with the current uh, uh, grid-based electric system because it's much smarter, it's smaller networks where you don't need to have large transmission lines associated with it. So it's more efficient, it loses less of the power than uh, current systems? That is correct, it is significantly more efficient. It's smarter because you can modulate the energy that is used, you can use artificial intelligence in order to predict where you're going to need your peak energy supplies. And the classic example of the vehicle we were talking about, you could get into your vehicle, go to your office, and while you're in your office, sitting in your office, your car would be connected to your smart grid that then allows you the provision of using the energy or storing the energy as what would be needed in your building. And therefore, with smart uh, technology for metering, um, you could even make some money going to the office, not just by doing your work, but also by your car actually discharging some of the energy it stored at your home place or street side uh, using solar cells to capture it. So you in the UK and uh, Theresa May did this cool thing uh, on her way out, right? Where she she puts uh, targets and now it's going to happen in the UK and the EU, everybody's talking about green, green, green all the time. Everybody's like, it's the number one priority right now. So now they need to put the action where their words are, right? They, now this the, things are going to happen right very soon things have to happen very soon otherwise uh, the the potentialities of climate change hitting us and and all the uh, gas and uh, fossil fuel uh, co2 gases that have gone out will probably start changing the way we live so i think uh, the the various provisions that the uk government are putting in place and in order to be carbon neutral by 2050 is extremely required. It's positive. It is very it's, positive. Even though she does it on her last days, it, she could have done it in the first days, but anyways, it, it's happening now, hopefully. Uh, and um, uh, uh, can you show, because you had a presentation yesterday, kind of yes. like at the opening. Yes, so this is very interesting because what I wanted to try to show was uh, that uh, when it comes to energy, the changes that we see within the world usage is quite slow. So if we were to compare the energy usage in 2010 to the energy usage that we see today in 2018, the change of renewables hasn't been very significant. Typically for the last 10-15 years, we've stood at about 80% fossil fuels and 20% renewables. That's because it's so difficult to make change. We as humans and society are ingrained in using fossil fuels. What it needs is a significant boost in order to change our lives to start using renewables. Now, in order to do so, we currently use solar cells based on silicon. Silicon provides nearly 90% of your solar energy. But we can do better because silicon needs about 100 microns of thickness in order to absorb the energy that we require uh, for energy harvesting. Now to put that into context, 100 microns is about the diameter of a human hair. So two diameters of a human hair uh, side by side will be the thickness of the silicon you need. Now the new materials we are using and working on called polymer electronics or polymer solar cells have come to the fifth generation of, of uh, technologies. And in looking at these sort of technologies, what we want to do is to be able to harvest that same amount of energy with 200 nanometers. So if you notice, there's a scale there from 200 microns to 200 nanometers it means that you're using a thousandth of the thickness of what we used previously to harvest the same amount of energies that the silicon solar does with polymer solar cells. It doesn't mean a thousand times cheaper, no? It doesn't necessarily mean it's a thousand times cheaper, but you're absolutely right. 
due to the scale of reduced material usage, you're using a thousandth of that material. So by definition, the cost of your material is going to be much lower. But saying that, the technology that we're using to produce these solar cells based on organic materials is sprayable. So it's much like painting, much like putting a coating on your roof or your wall. What we're doing is using solution processable inks that are produced in layers such that they can harvest the energy that we require. Is it so, what's happening here? So this is a this solar cell is a classic example of a solar cell that is going to be there on your rooftops, on your cars, on your windows in the on future. On the wall. Yes. So as you can see, it's truly flexible. It's made out of layers of materials that starts with a metal grid on the back. That metal grid is on plastic, and above that metal grid you would have a number of layers that allow you to capture the sunlight and that is topped up with a transparent material in this particular case. And this is, can just be done by roll to roll, potentially very, very cheaply. It's the same technology that's used for your newspaper runs. So the idea is that with the scale of manufacture, with large numbers, square kilometers of organic solar cells being produced, we will be able to get as cheap as newspapers. So your initial summation that indicated can we go to a thousandth of the cost of a silicon solar cell may not be that bad a prediction, but I would say right at the beginning you're probably talking about uh, an order of magnitude lower. That's, but that's that, amazing if you can do that. Yes. The, the, the order of magnitude itself is quite incredible because at present, if we were to compare the cost of energy provision from uh, silicon-based solar to fossil fuel-based uh, electricity, they are comparable. So, for example, at present, just last week uh, in California, uh, they provided an auction for 400 megawatts of uh, electrical energy yeah. and that 400 watts of electrical energy was auctioned off at uh, point zero one nine um, dollars uh, per kilowatt hour so that's basically just under two cents per kilowatt hour so per megawatt hour you're probably talking about uh, twenty dollars to put that into context, within the UK, nuclear energy is being provided or is being requested from Hinkley Point C at 95 pounds per megawatt hour on a 35 year payback deal. So when we are, the government is trying to buy nuclear at 95 pounds, we can provide silicon based renewable solar energy at 20. So five times cheaper already? It's five times cheaper already. You do have to look at the point that in the case of solar at the moment, due to its intermittency, you need to have the storage capability too. It needs to have its infrastructure and as I said, the smart grid. So smart they, kids and electric cars, Yes, at least. Yes. So these are the different provisions that need to be there before we can start really thinking about uh, the, the availability of total um, solar power based but people buy a lot of cars every year so if you just have a large percentage of all the new cars and pretty rapidly over two or three years try to have a majority of them be electric maybe you could have the smart grid and before like three four years and five years from now well i think that is happening and once more the uk government have taken the lead there where they said by 2030 there will be no more fossil fuel only based vehicles being provided uh, through, through the national network. So just to put that into context, within the next 10 years, there will be no petrol only cars being sold in the UK. That's a great. Yes. In China, in certain cities, it's even faster where certain ministers have come out and said by 2030, uh, 2025, they want to start removing fossil fuel only based cars. 
So a number of countries and a number of European nations also have similar provisions being put within their governance structure to fast forward this adaptation, adoption of uh, electric cars, electrical vehicles uh, in order to save the planet as well as provide cheap energy. Is there uh, other ways to store the energy? Are there some other things that are being researched? Could you use, for example, huge tanks of hydrogen or something like that? There are have, like, many, many routes in which you can store uh, electricity. And as we currently know, even today, if you didn't have nuclear, you need to have some way of providing uh, continuous electrical supply. So a typical example is hydroelectricity, where during uh, low usage, uh, you would pump water up to hills or higher places. And then during peak hours, you would uh, use that to run your turbines. Uh, flywheels is another technology that is being used even today to store energy. Fly what? Flywheels, where basically you, you just have uh, a wheel that is turning and, and you keep turning it faster and faster uh, using oversupply of energy and you decrease the speed whenever you want to pull the energy out of those flywheels. Uh, are the flywheels or the, the water-based systems, are they efficient enough? Or they, do they also lose a lot of power in the uh, they, they do lose some power, but again, they are as efficient as you can get at present for the scale in which we want to work with. But probably, It's just for backup when it's very, very cloudy, right? Yes, and, and probably, probably the most exciting area currently is energy storage. And in energy storage too, there's huge leaps and bounds being made. It's not just lithium-ion, lithium-sulfur that is coming, sodium-ion batteries, but many other types of new... Uh, energy storage. For example, um, in the older days, if you took your laptop and you had one hour of battery life, that would have been quite significant. My current computer has 10 hours of battery life. So within the time frame of five years, you're probably talking about a 10 times increase in the capacity. And what we are also seeing is that there is about a 20% decrease in the cost of batteries lithium-ion batteries at present and with newer technologies coming on board I can only see the cost of energy storage getting lower and lower uh, to match the reduction in cost we are seeing in the solar energy provision too. Do you think the sodium or another technology is going to replace lithium-ion soon? Uh, there are other technologies that are coming that are certainly competitive. Maybe cleaner or what's called a easier to make, cheaper? Yes, there are cheaper materials and also we don't even have to go down that route of sodium or lithium based ions. We can do even supercapacitors and pseudocapacitors, but these are much more used when you need to have fast power delivery. There are mixtures of both supercapacitors and lithium ion batteries. So th there are a number of areas in which this is being looked at. And within the UK, once more, we've got the Faraday Challenge, which is a 280 million pound program set up by the government that is purely looking at new ways in which energy can be stored. And in your presentation, you also talk more about the efficiency. So what's the latest in terms of this technology matching or potentially perhaps exceeding the silicon-based uh, uh, efficiency of solar, uh, maybe also most importantly the cost, right? Yes, so it's, it's a very interesting point that we currently have, that uh, if you think of just purely plastic, uh, Sorry. So purely plastic electronics, yeah. you know, uh, we, on a daily basis there's new technologies coming on board, and what I'm showing you here is some new non-fullerene acceptors that have come on the market and with this sort of non-fullerene acceptors these are materials that can be used with polymers over large areas we are getting over 10 percent power conversion efficiency in fact we can push this up to 16 percent are you talking about what's going on here yes that is correct so technically we can go up to 16 percent now on the other hand we can also start looking at the newest materials, the newest kid on the block, where we, we, we have materials that have come through called perovskites. And these perovskites are pushing on to 24% now. 
Now, 24% is very significant because that's beyond silicon. So you can do perovskite with this? Yes, this is the same technology that we will be using for perovskite materials. And looking at the perovskite provision, uh, it is really a very uh, cheap technology. Some would say it's cheaper than earth. Uh, the, the, the whole point of this is that it's some of the cheapest materials that are being used. But, you know, like everything else, there are the plus and the minus points. And in the case of perovskites, uh, the highest efficiency materials currently is using lead-based compounds. So once more, due to the toxicity, there are certain uh, precautions we need to take. But we will be once more looking within the research sector on how we reduce the perovskites that are being used or mitigate against that particular material system because we are talking about small small fractions we are talking about less than 0.1 percent of the entire material build with being just perovskites. Is it possible to replace lead with something else? Uh, we are working on replacing lead with tin at present unfortunately uh, that will reduce the efficiency of our devices um, so for example you could take something that is at working at 20 to 24 degree uh, percentage uh, efficiency uh, down to probably uh, something more around 14 so we are losing but we, we keep uh, we, we keep uh, inventing different types of materials that can keep reducing the cost so I think on one hand, we are looking at the next generation of plastic electronics that are coming through. But on the other hand, we already have silicon-based technologies that can certainly compete with grid uh, electricity. So I think that is the key thing that we need to work on. And if I can just show you one further chart as to how cheap can solar get. And this basically is showing that if we keep deploying silicon in the current manner for solar, by 2035, there is a good chance that the cost of electricity from solar will be half that of any fossil fuel based system. Just to put it into context, if you were to go and look at your electricity bill today, you will probably be paying something like 15 cents of a dollar for every kilowatt hour that you are consuming. And if I were to say that with solar, I can provide that at three cents per kilowatt hour. Now, wouldn't you want to change your power supply, change your lifestyle and also help save this earth? That's the proposition I have for you today in using silicon or other new technology based solar in order to provide your energy. In terms of changing lifestyle, to me it sounds like people could be using even more energy and be cleaner. That is correct. You could, so you certainly. could actually be consuming more, I mean, having more fun on this planet. It doesn't have to be like you're hurting to be green. Uh, that is correct, but at the end of the day, what we all would like to do is to democratize the whole process of energy. And at the present time, we in the West are using probably, uh, on average, five times more energy than uh, some of our Asian colleagues or uh, African colleagues. So as a result, if we are truly trying to be democratic in terms of energy usage, we, we need to start uh, having energy efficiency gains within the Western world. At present, within the Western world, uh, on average, in, in the US, you would probably be using about 10 uh, kilowatts on a daily basis in terms of uh, energy provision. Whereas in Europe, on average, you're talking about two and a half kilowatts. Uh, in terms of Africa, you're talking about less than a kilowatt. So as a result, we really do need to start uh, becoming more democratic with the energy. And uh, there's no fun in just wasting energy, right? Absolutely, so right. Nobody's gaining anything, so yes. we can just uh, be smarter. And uh, humans, we are, we are quite smart, right? Sometimes it's a little bit uh, sad if the, the smart 
brains are not being used and somehow you know like oh what you know what i mean yes like, I, um, i do understand and i think the key point that you made there was the fact that uh, if we were to just waste energy for the sake of uh, of instead of walking down uh, 500 meters or taking your car that is fully air conditioned to drive to that point uh, you know that's a luxurious way of living whereas on the other hand many other people um, depend on uh, energy to such an extent that uh, they don't have uh, electricity in the rural communities so therefore you know it's a luxurious way of style for us but it's absolute necessity in some of the third world developing countries that need this electricity not just in order for school kids to learn or in the nights to be able to read up books to be able to connect to the internet and tap the vast amount of energy and knowledge that is out there uh, that we take for granted i i have a feeling that uh, it looks like a lot of the technologies exist it's just a question of somebody saying it has to be done uh, but on the other hand how much technology doesn't exist yet and needs to be found uh, if there is a will there is a way of doing things i'm a great believer in that and at present i think we just need to have a number of world leaders from developing nations and uh, developed countries to work together in order to find certain uh, areas in which we can demonstrate our technology i'm pretty sure that we will be able to demonstrate this in countries such as singapore already uh, and it really is about scaling it up next uh, to provide this and then provide it to everybody in the world all the developing countries can have better access to energy and that would be amazing for them that's the dream the dream is that everyone has free energy and if necessary someone pays for their supply so it's a bit like uh, data at the present time you go to the developed countries you go to singapore you go to hong kong you go to the various airports in all major cities you have a free internet connection you have unlimited data downloads i believe electricity can also be sold in a similar manner simply because if you think that there is a 10000 oversupply of solar electricity at present you know there is no money in trying to charge people for the electricity bills it should be a service industry and much like the air water uh, that we have around us uh, it should be provided free of charge is there any chance in the next 5 years we have a role like this that is uh, as efficient or more efficient than silicon and that is uh, unbreakable and just stays on the walls and the roofs forever kind of without breaking and then uh, or something like that or easily replaceable to a point where just it's a no brainer yeah um, i think it's going to be a no brainer i don't think we do need to replace silicon with this sort of plastic electronics because in everything in life it's about an energy mix it's about having silicon where silicon is appropriate and having organics where organics are appropriate but to put it into context as to whether you need it to uh, last a lifetime or not organic materials such as the ones we are looking at in this case has a payback time of less than 1 year to put that into context if i were to buy silicon solar in order for me to pay back the capital it will take me around 6 to 8 years at present which is already okay i would think yes it's already like okay any, because it used to be 20 years any bank would say this is a no brainer yes. to invest yes it should be yes now in organics you're actually talking about less than a year probably 6 months now just imagine that right you spray coat your house every 6 months right because your energy provision has already paid for the cost of implementing that change uh, but you don't so need to do it every 6 months we don't need to do it every 6 months but that's the sort of uh, uh, aspects that you could have because these solar cells will last you up to 2 years and in time with increased stability we will probably go up to 5 years so as a result after your initial period of payback of 6 months the rest of it is going to be free energy for you uh because your capital has already been paid for 
with the electricity that you've used.